So what I'm going to talk today about the main adaptations small sample statistics, and this is the work which I work with Sean and Dean. Um, let me just give you a little bit of motivation of, hmm, well, let me just move my laptop. Um, let me just give you a little bit of motivation as to, uh, uh, Problem is the worst. I think the PowerPoint just got stuck. Sorry about that. Yeah. The motivation of, of why, uh, what we're trying to do here. So if you look at the most of the machine learning algorithms, most of the assumption that you're making is that the distribution of training samples <coughs> is the same as the distribution of test samples. That's the typical assumption. But in many real world settings, that particular assumption fails to hold. And it's one of the central problems in, in a lot of uh, practical domains, I guess, uh, in a lot of talks in this, in this workshop addressing that issue. So what I'm going to do in this talk is I'm going to concentrate on one particular, I'm going to try to introduce one particular idea, a very simple idea. And the idea is that what we're going to do is we're going to make the following assumption. We're going to say that our training set is going to consist of a small number of sample domains. Right, so we're going to have a number of sample domains, but we're going to have lots and lots of examples in each domain. And the goal that we're going to try to do is we're going to try to generalize to new domains. So how does that, uh, let me give you just an intuition of, of how we uh, initially looked at that problem. Suppose I give you n list, n different characters data set, that's a standard data set, and I um, contain 10 different classes, and I try to classify it that discriminates twos versus all the other hand written digits. Okay. I'm gonna call this a source domain. So I can train my favorite classifier, and what happens here is that I can get the accuracy below 1%. So I can do really well. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to test my model, discriminative model, in that setting, twos versus nines in the target domain. I'm going to call it target domain. Notice that images of nines never appear in this in this sets of images. Right. So any any ideas, any guesses, what would happen? Seems like uh, your classifier should be able to to cope with that. Nine nine to two. Some nines to look something like twos. Yeah, so what happens here is that these are just areas under rock curves, these were logistic regressions, I think. And what you're seeing here is you really add features. This was out 2,000 features using deep belief network style features, and they typically give state of the art results here. What happens here is that if you look at the test there of generalization on the source domain, so I give, if I show you new images of twos and I try to discriminate between new images of these guys, this is what happens. And you know, that that thing here goes up to about less than 1%. So I can do really well. But notice what happens <coughs> to the um, target domain. Right? So what happens here is you have a quick drop in the performance of the model as you add these features. And notice how big the gap between these two, uh, 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 between these two uh, models, I mean, between these two different domains. And you know, Sean also tried using this type of uh, algorithm on SVM, using various kernels, logistic and linear regression, various feature choices. You see that problem over and over again. And it's not very surprising, right? He would say, well, <coughs> you're testing, if you're training on this uh, particular task and you're testing on this task, well, you expected that. There are no particular generalization error bounds that will tell you how well you can do here, right? Yeah. So it says that everything is two or it's 50-50? Let's say that the two versus nine is fifty-fifty. So the classifier would classify everything in two. No, this was balanced. So this is a balanced data set. So okay. you had, I think, in this case, you had one thousand images of twos and one thousand images of of, of these things, right? Yeah. Wait, so you're applying the test error, so lower is better, or so so so, so high is better. Sorry, high is better. That's accurate. 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 <laughs> this is the area under the rock curve, so high is better. Oh, okay. Uh, so, um, uh, so we looked at this problem and said, well, is there anything we can do here? Um, and uh, what we're going to do is we're going to make the following assumption. We're going to assume that we have a distribution of domains. We have a small number of sample domains. We're going to make an assumption that these small number of domains are independently drawn from some distribution of the domains. And we're going to make it a little bit more precise on the next slide. So for example, in the previous example, we could just say, well, suppose that we have eight known domains in our training set domains of the form 2 versus 0, 2 versus 1, 2, two versus 3. And then the goal is to how well we can do on a new domain of that form. So really the idea here, if you look at this problem, you would say, well, what you want to do, you want to pick out features that are discriminative of 2. Right? Um, 
if you if you want to apply it to uh, a, a user model of that form. Now, you could argue that maybe it's better to build a generative model. If you build generative models of tools versus other tools, you can do discrimination that way. And that certainly is one solution. And, um, you know, in, the, in my view, it's not obvious which is better. Um, in some cases, in particular, I'm going to show you some results uh, using uh, high dimensional images, and there it's a little bit hard to build good generative models of those images. Right. So, in this, in this, what we're going to take uh, uh, a supervised learning approach. And if you think about this problem, it's much like a supervised learning problem, except for your sample points are now sample domains. Okay. So here's the definition. Um, you have a distribution of the domains. Uh, condition on the particular domain, you have a distribution of the input-output pairs. Define this one here. And what we're going to do in this work in particular, uh, we're going to try to find a weight vector W so as to minimize this loss. It's just the square loss. Notice here we're taking expectation with respect to domains as well as expectation with respect to the input value. Mm -hmm. And what we're going to make, uh, assume is that our training set is going to contain n non domains denoted by d1 up to dn, where each domain, the assumption is that each domain is sample independent. Okay. Now, as a side point, just for clarity of presentation, what, what I'm going to make an assumption is that typically in practice, we're making an assumption that n is small, the number of domains is small, but we can get lots and lots of examples in each domain. So in particular, we're going to make an assumption that these expectations, so these are correlations, expectations of x with respect to y, y is the target x, v, as well as covariances within each domain, we can estimate them very well. So I'm just going to make an assumption that we can have those expectations. In practice, we'll get empirical estimates of those expectations. Okay. This is for, for just clarity of presentation. If you look at the paper, there's some, uh, 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 some description of how we deal with them. You know, we can't estimate these things. OK, so the goal, the, the, the real goal of this, problem, uh, of this work is, is, is trying to avoid overfitting as we add uh, features. So we're trying <coughs> to find features in such a way that when we're adding those features, we can try to improve uh, um, the error on the new domains. Right? Now, if you think about greedy way of selecting features. The greedy way of selecting features would basically look at your source domains, domains that you have, and you try to decrease the training set there. Okay. And that performs quite poorly, as, as you've seen in the previous slide. So if I'm just selecting features based on the training <coughs> domains, uh, that doesn't do quite well. So what can we do? Well, let's look at um, the optimal weights. What's the optimal weight factor that we can get? I'm also going to make an assumption that we have normalized features so that the expected value of xi squared is going to be equal to 1 for all xi. In this case, the optimal weight has this form. That just comes out of a standard uh, squared loss. Think about fitting linear regression models. So that's the weight, uh, that's the optimal weight. Now, what we want to do is we want to find features in such a way that the corresponding estimate wi is closer to the truth than to zero, because zero in this case would correspond to a null prediction. So one way, the natural way of estimating uh, uh, these weights would be to just look at the, uh, 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 the average, the empirical average. Right? That just says, well, for every single domain, we have an estimate of our expectations, and then we average over those domains. What this essentially says is that what we're going to do is we're going to take all of our domains, throw everything together, and just estimate the mean. That's what it says. So no distinction between various domains. So if you think about back to our examples, when we were looking at two versus ones, two versus threes, two versus fours, <coughs> you just put everything together into one big data set and you estimate. That, that's your original set of results that you showed. That's, that's the original setting of the results. And that, in fact, if you actually pick the maximum one, that would be equivalent to doing greedy selection. Right? Now, and that's, so that's the natural estimate. And then if you look at the central limit theorems, you're saying that the thing should be converging to the, to the truth of the order of one over school of square root of three. And there's uh, some true uh, uh, variance here. Now, what we're trying to do <coughs> here is we're trying to do something very simple and very intuitive. But what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to take into account the empirical variance. Okay? So the empirical variance is just going to be computed this way. And, and we're going to try to take into account this empirical variance when we're going to be selecting those features. Right. This empirical variance basically says the variability of the weights across multiple domains. Okay. 
So what we want, in a sense, is we want <coughs> this value to be high, because that becomes more predictable. <coughs> we have high correlations with the targets. But what we also want to have is we want to have empirical variance to be small. So we want to select features that are not uh, varying a lot across multiple domains. So if you have a feature that's very good for some domains, but not very predictive for other domains, that value is going to be high. Right? <coughs> so that's just uh, a, a very simple uh, uh, observation here. So now the question is, how can we combine these two things? So one thing you can do is, if you make an assumption that these estimates will follow normal distribution, you can use to do t-test. And the t-statistics has this fault. That's a standard t-test. Uh, <coughs> and what you're effectively doing here is you're testing the null hypothesis where the population mean is zero. So if you look at these two terms, again, if this value is very high, then you would say that's uh, a good feature. But at the same time, you also want to control for the variance. Right? If the variance is very high, it will drive the t-statistics to zero. So that's uh, basically that's just the intuition of, of, of how can we select those features. Um, now, you may ask the question, well, what if new eyes actually they don't fall along the distribution? Right? So that could be very wrong statistics. And then uh, if you look at the paper, there is a, uh, we cite a, a number of which shows that t-statistics are <coughs> robust. And what comes out of it is, is the theorem that essentially says that we can accurately test exponential number of features with fairly high confidence. So this, let's just look at the theorem a little bit. What it says is, is the following. We have to make an assumption that uh, uh, the expected value of x and y condition on d and this term here is symmetric, so that's one of the assumptions I think that we couldn't get rid of. Uh, so that's, we, we, we have to make that assumption. So it might be true, it might be false. Um, now suppose that f is a set of features whose size satisfies this expression here. So notice the size is exponential in n. Then for all xi in that set, we have the probability greater than y minus delta, this expression here, where we're not making any assumptions on the bounds of x and y. Well, we're making assumption of the existence of the first models. <laughs> again, if you look at this expression here, if you're taking sample variance into account, again, sample variance is, is, is small, then we have that estimate here. So if you look at the paper, there is a proof of the paper in, uh, in the paper um, in a little bit more details. But let me show you how we actually use this in practice. In practice, the algorithm comes to be a fairly uh, simple algorithm. What we do is the following. First of all, instead of searching over exponentially many subsets, what we're going to do is we're going to do greedy selection of features, just as standard people do uh, that. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to, for each feature x i, we're going to compute the empirical mean and variance. So the mean is just what you would compute uh, uh, in a standard setting. And then we'll compute the unbiased estimate of the variance in this case. That will give you some idea of how <coughs> variability of that feature across multiple domains. And then we're going to choose the feature with the highest t-statistics. And uh, that will be the feature that we're going to be choosing. If you did the greedy selection, you will just choose the feature with the highest mean, we lose a which is the estimate of the W in this case. And then we get standard updates equations for the width. So that's, that's pretty standard. Uh, right, and then you know, it's typically the case if we have finite number of samples in each domain, we can estimate these expectations just based on empirical estimates. Uh, so <coughs> let me show you uh, what happens in practice if we use that procedure. So it's the same data set, uh, and in this case, you're looking at the target domain where you're testing twos versus sixes. So again, the blue curve shows the t-greedy where you're selecting features based on the t-statistic, so you're taking empirical variances into account, and the red curve shows the naive greedy you still see that you know you can add up to about 10 features here and then the curves start dropping down. So there is obviously needs to be some form of a stopping rule. And it's, uh, in practice, it's even design avoidable because we have a, a, a new target domain here. This is just another example where we're testing two versus three. Uh, same, same degradation this happens, but we consistently observe that when we, we can add many more features when we're looking, when we're using t-statistics as opposed to just doing greedy selection here. And these curves just basically show the performance on the source domain. So generalization performance on the source domain. So you can see that the blue curve is slightly below the red one, which essentially uh, you'd expect that because you're not selecting features that maximize the training error on, on the source domain. You're picking some features that are more robust. 
Uh, and finally, just to show you some results on the CIFAR data set, this is the data set that contains 10 different objects. And these are different objects you have. And it's a fairly complicated data set. So if you look at that data set, building a generative model for these, for these images is, is quite hard. Um, and uh, again, if you look at the same statistics here as we look for the MNIST data set, if you're looking at naive grid, at some point it just drops almost to random. There is the, the T grid is able to uh, uh, um, get some reasonable number. In terms of the features, we could reliably select up to 50 features, up to 50 reliable features. <coughs> uh, and this is just plot showing you that when we're averaging all different, over 10 different classes. So roughly speaking, again, we can do uh, we can do much better. And uh, thank you.